thank you everybody for coming. Uh, this was scheduled for January, and of course we had some bad weather and had to reschedule it. And I would like to make it known that we are limited to having 30 people in the audience due to COVID restrictions. You have to have your mask on. You have to wear your mask. Um, couples friends can sit together, but you're supposed to be socially distancing, although they set the chairs up one next to each other. Um, we have quite a few, oh, next time, March, is our next meeting. And it's, uh, let's see, the Patriot and the Pirates, a discovery of an 1846 letter penned by George Robinson of Baldwinsville to his congressman reveals the strange link between this early veteran, settler, and surveyor and two of history's most notorious pirates. So, um, but we would like you to sign up on the library website. You go to the library programs, and then when you see uh, March, oh, go to the calendar. Eighth, go to the calendar, and you see March eighth. It'll list Beecham Historical Club. And there's a place to sign up there. You should get a response back. You should get a reply back saying that your email or your registration has been accepted. Um, I, I know it's been in the paper. It's been in the um, Facebook and all the groups. Bob, you know, you were involved in Baldwinsville and all those groups. But we have to limit it to 30. So if we get more than 30 people, we're going to have to ask some people to leave. So you're better off signing up and getting a chance of being here. Okay, any questions about that? Um, if you're a guest, we'd like you to join the historical club. There is a membership form. Mary back there has the forms. It's $10 a year. And um, you get some email notices about meetings rather than just looking at the paper. I guess that's about all the benefits you get besides <laughs> listening to the programs. And Mary also has a list of the uh, programs for the rest of the year that are up there at the desk. Any questions? Okay, we'll do the pledge and then we'll start the program. Now that you can all sit and be comfortable. Yep. Flag is over the corner here by the popcorn machine. <laughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, and now on to our program. Thank you, Bob, for taping. Oh, yes, thank you, Bob, for taping. You can watch this on Pack B. And i got to move this microphone back. Yeah. That goes to Bill, right here. So how many people have been to one of these before? Raise your hand. I can't see your hands anyway, so I have no idea how many. So maybe one of you have come, maybe none of you have come. I think you're okay. We're going to try things a little differently tonight because the case has been written about. Um, usually I create these stories from whole cloth. Uh, with the help of, of past local historians like Bonnie Kisselstein and people like, well, current local historians like Bonnie, and gentlemen like this. Who knows who this is? Beecham. Right. William Beecham, our namesake. I, I say it every time, but I, I can't resist. I want to be 80 and be able to ride a bike with a boat around my hat down the streets <laughs> of Albany. If I can do that, the world will be my oyster. So barring that, I'm going to live a pretty um, sedate life, I think. Um, you know, the, um, I don't usually use notes, for those of you who know. I do everything extemporaneously from my memory, but clearly I'm getting old, so I'm relying on notes tonight. And as I said, we've got a trial transcript, and we've got testimony from witnesses. This is a really different story. Instead of Steve going out and researching and trying to find things out, this exists. It's in the public record. Um, you can get it out of the Baldwinsville Library if you want to pour through 250 pages of trial transcript, um, which I don't recommend, but it's there. Um, what I try to do in my presentations, um, distinct from other people, is I try to focus on kind of obscure stories 
unusual people, places, events from our past. And I really focus in on the 1800s, and I like to try to imagine what life would have been like. Can I take this off? Thank you. What life would have been life like for our predecessors living in the village of Ballsville and, and, and the environs? I think it was a very different life. I think it was a more difficult life, but in some cases, I think it was a much simpler life than the one we have today. The four stories here, I won't, I won't get into detail because some of you have seen them. Uh, the first one about something's up and down the street is about spiritualism in Baldwinsville and a spiritualist you probably have never heard of unless you've driven down Downer Street because that's where she lived and her father, in the street's named after him. The second one is the Baldwin home for indigent gentlewomen. How many folks know that there was a whole branch of the Baldwin family that emigrated to Texas? And they did extremely well down there. You know, they helped to found the city of Austin. Uh, I'm sorry, Houston, excuse me, Houston. There's a high-rise hotel there named after a Baldwin daughter, one of Jonas and Betsy uh, Baldwin's daughters. And they ended up doing very well, quite, uh, thank you very much, except for the young lady pictured there um, who, who was involved in a murder and will, and it's just crazy stuff. The next one is about, um, who's heard of Picketville? If you're from out in rural Lysander, near Little Utica, Jacksonville, that area, there was a little community of sawmills called Picketville. Um, on the Beaver Lake Creek, which flowed out of what was Beaver Lake north to Ox Creek. And it was kind of a going concern. It didn't have a church or a grange or a school, but people lived there and they thrived there. And it was so, a self-contained community and it disappeared. You know, by the 1930s, 40s, 50s, it was completely gone. There are a few vestiges there, but it's mostly gone. Interesting story there. And there's the last resident right there. On the right was the one we did in November. It's called the Free Loving Bible Communists of Baldwinsville. <laughs> I, I also am a member of the Scruple Historical Society in Phoenix, and I was out there, and a lady came up to me and said, I heard your presentation was great. I didn't want to go because I thought it was about communism. Um, <laughs> it wasn't. <laughs> it was about some people who were very disaffected and disillusioned with life in Baldwinsville, even though it's a great place to live, and so they went off for parts unknown and joined communes that practiced things like free love. Um, and arranged marriage and vegetarianism and a lot of good things like women's rights, women's suffrage and things like that. Um, so anyway, if you're so disposed and you have time on your hands, they're all available um, on PACB TV's YouTube channel. Just go in and look for the history playlist. They're about an hour and 10 minutes long. Um, if you get bored, you can do something else, but they're, they're, they're there. And they're there for one and only reason and that's because of Bob Edgett, because he films all these things. And can you hear me, by the way? Okay, yeah. fantastic. All right. <laughs> you can. Okay, good. So um, this story is a little different. Um, and, and why did I put an axe and a crime scene up there? Well, because there was an axe and a crime scene. So that pretty much explains it. If you're a little squeamish, although you look at what's on the Internet and TV today, how can you be squeamish about something like this? It was pretty pedestrian, although it was blood, bloodthirsty. Uh, worse stuff, you know, you're going to see worse stuff on YouTube and the internet and anything else. But um, if you're squeamish, go on out to the library. They've got some great books in the new section. You can come back when the whole thing is over. Um, it's a little different. Um, it was very violent and tragic. And what I try to do is interject some entertainment values, some comedic value, and human interest stories in a lot of these stories because they're not all gloom and doom. This one's pretty much gloom and doom. So it's not a happy-go-lucky story. It's got some pretty, uh, some pretty difficult parts to it. Um, so one thing I want to do, there is audience participation, and I'm looking for it. So I am going to need someone to hold this cantaloupe. <laughs> and I brought my ax. <laughs> And so we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna simulate what happened in a barn in town of Van Buren. I just need somebody to hold the muskmelon. <laughs> Rob? I'm a really good shot. I chop. I know you're stealing. I'm not going to do it. <laughs> that is a smart man. I chop wood every night in my garage. Um, you know, the muskmelon, I'm not sure about that. We'll have, to, we'll have to play that by ear. But it does involve an, ask, uh, an axe and uh, I thought the muskmelon was a good substitute for somebody's cranium. Um, so in each of these presentations, I try to ask three different questions depending on the content of the presentation. The questions aren't always the same, but I try to focus in on three. 
because I want there to be a beginning, middle, and end, and so we can all kind of understand what happened. In this case, you know, why was this such a why was this such big news in Baldwinsville and beyond? This was a local murder, but it, it became big news in places like New York and the New York Times and the uh, other other places or Chicago Tribune. It really traveled well. Now there were a lot of murders going on at this time in the United States, so why was this one so particular and why did it get so much press? We'll talk a little bit about that before we get into the actual crime itself. And then later on we can cover these other questions about what really happened uh, and what was the aftermath. aftermath. Um, you know, I know some of you are going to know who this guy is, uh, Tony Christopher, right? Um, and I don't know if Lynn Pinto's here tonight? No. Nope. Okay, so um, Tony was, I think, our first Van Buren Town historian, if I'm not mistaken, 15 years. And what's even more incredible is I wrote a column in The Messenger about local history every other week for about two years, and I gave up. It was too exhausting. I was working full time. This guy wrote a local history article in the Baldwinsville Messenger every week, not for two years, not for 10 years, but for 15 years. And they're very, very good, and they're compiled in a book in the local history section of the library. I highly recommend you take it out. All kinds of fascinating stories in there. What's interesting about this story and about Tony is in his series Sketches of Yesterday, this is the only story he devoted more than one part to. In other words, he carried it over from week to week. Six parts he carried on in this story. He started out with five, and after the fifth, he got so much mail from readers, because the messenger was much better read in those days and read by people in other states, they came back with their own anecdotes. Well, my grandmother told me, and my uncle was involved, and here's what really happened. So he ended up writing six articles that are really illuminating, and he was a great, a great resource. And, and you know, I just got to give hats off to Bonnie. She and Sue McManus write this history mystery column in The Messenger every week, week in, week out. How many people re are able to read that? I still can't see your hands, so that's all right. But I think Bonnie deserves a round of applause for everything she's done. Okay, so what about this story? Well, a couple of things. Number one, ignore all the names you see up there or else you're going to spoil the whole story. I don't want you knowing who did this or who died, so just pretend there's nobody up there. But there was a book written about this, and it's kind of incredible when you think about it. It's huge. I have a copy of it here. There's a copy in the local history library. Mine is a reprint. I'd love to find the actual someday, but they're pretty rare. And it literally, from the day of the indictment all the way through to the final resolution of the case, articulates every single thing that was said in the court of law. It's a great resource, and it's where I derived most of my information. Like I said, most of my stories, I go out and I dig, and I talk to people, and I investigate. In this case, I really just had to go to this book. Um, and thank goodness it's on the Internet Archive online, so you can do searches and things like that. So it's also available there. So on the right, what's crazy is around 1875, this became so popular, they started advertising it. So there was a local publication company that had the contract um, with the Supreme Court to print any and all court transcripts they wanted to, and they printed this one out, and it became a bestseller in 1875. So you think about true crime today, starting with In Cold Blood with Truman Capote back in the 50s, 60s, or whatever. This was 100 years earlier, and people just couldn't get enough about this case. So it was truly a bestseller at the time. Again, the library has a copy of this, and you can, uh, you can check it out for yourself. Another book that I found, and I kind of collect old books, especially the more esoteric and obscure ones, it's called The Annals of Murder. Now, People think I have a strange hobby, and I do. Um, this, guy, this guy went back, and books like the one I just showed you, and pamphlets that were written about these trials and these cases, these murders, he tracked every single one of them, went to all these academic libraries, and from the colonial times to 1900, he documented every single murder case that resulted in some kind of pamphlet, public, publication, book, whatever. Guess how many? 1,126 are documented in here. Now, Baldwinsville homicide is in here. And it's only one of three Onondaga County cases that took place in the 1800s that had a pamphlet printed about it. There were murders here, trust me. 
It's been a long-standing tradition in American culture. But um, there were only three that were printed about in Onondaga County, and this was one of them. And you can see the other two up there. Joseph Mason for killing William Farrell in Onondaga. Uh, the Filer murder case, some of you may have heard of that. That's kind of famous. That was on Onondaga Hill. Uh, and then the Baldwinsville homicide in 1873. There are none other from Onondaga County in here. But down at the bottom, you'll see my favorite, my personal favorite. It happened pretty close by, Madison County in Sullivan. And, you know, the guy got caught. He admitted he did it. I think he was executed. But before he was executed, they kind of said, you know, why did you do this? Why did you kill your wife? And his name was Hitchcock. And Hitchcock put his motive quite succinctly when he said, quote, I thought I could live more agreeably with some other woman than my wife. So... <laughs> Poor Belinda got the arsenic and Alpheus was condemned. So not a lot of good reasons there. Anyway, who's, anybody who's interested in that can, can check that out. That's another one. So, um, you know, I did my own research, as I often do. And, and I would like to write a book about this someday. I keep threatening to write books and never get around to it. But based on my own research, we actually have seven potential local murders before 1900 in the general area. Now I've got places like South Granby up there because it, you know, you can't really get there from here. It doesn't belong to any, anywhere. Anybody from South Granby? No. Okay. Um, but you've got a murder, uh, the Mud Lake murder is very fascinating. I've done a lot of research on that. It took place, as you might expect, right, ne right next to Mud Lake. Uh, the Seneca River tragedy. Again, I said potential because a wife drowned while she was out in a rowboat with her husband and under questionable circumstances, husband just happened to be having an affair with the woman in the next farm over. So it's a little suspect and I think maybe there was some foul play. Jack's Reef murder over in Jack's Reef. The Cold Springs case was a potential poisoning by a husband by his much, much younger wife. Uh, the South Granby murder the Little Utica Hotel murder, I mentioned that in a previous presentation, uh, where some guys had a little too much to drink and somebody got stabbed outside. Um, the thing that distinguishes these from the case we're going to talk about tonight is they were all crimes of passion. Okay, so family and friends, and if not family and friends, spur of the moment, right? I'm drinking, I get pissed off, you get in my way, I don't want you around anymore, and things escalate and something bad happens. That's not the case with this case. This was a case of very cold-blooded, premeditated murder. Um, you can't really describe it any other way. It was very, very planned and plotted out and carried out in, I thought, a very, very surgical and cold-hearted fashion. So we'll talk more about that. So um, that's a little bit about background and murders and what was going on in the county. You know, on a wider scale, on the broader American stage, by 1860, and I want to back up just for a second. I didn't put this in here, but you know, Edgar Allan Poe wrote the first true crime uh, tale called the, the Mystery of Marie Roget back in 1840, 1841, I think. First true crime book in the history of the world, really. It influenced people like Arthur Conan Doyle and Sherlock Holmes and others. That kind of took hold. People became interested in true crime, and Poe was a part of that. But you also had rags like this. You had newspapers, and you know, you can think about it. We're, we're all old enough to remember going through the supermarket checkout line, and there was the National Enquirer and everything else. But instead of, had alien, instead of having aliens on there, or JFK still alive, or whatever, they had a lot of these kind of really titillating, sensational, tragic, uh, you know, acts of tragedy and crime on the covers. You got somebody here who's falling off a wagon to their death. You got, you got a lady here who was being attacked by a man with ill intent and her dog went after him and tore his neck out. Um, you got a lady here who, <laughs> I think she was adulterous and she was killed by the beyond. There's a hand and a gun, but you really don't know where it's coming from. It's disembodied. So there was some spiritualism at play there. And over here, same thing. You got a guy who killed a woman. And right away, she shows up in the window like, what did you do? How could you do this? So there was a lot of sensational journalism going on in the country, a lot of yellow sheet newspapers and things like that. So people were becoming more accustomed, I think, uh, and acclimated to seeing crimes like this 
on newspapers and in their media of the day, right? It wasn't the internet, but this is how they got their news. It was a very popular publication and it was paralleled by one in London as well that did exactly the same thing. And you open up the paper, and I did, I went online and checked these things out, and it's just like all kinds of sordid crimes and tales and just, just sensational stuff. What I didn't quite understand, I got it, crimes, people against people, man on man, but they seem to really be obsessed about the animals out there and the risk that they pose to people. And I think it was kind of sensational in its own right. I never really knew that domestic animals were this dangerous. I have a dog at home, and I'm kind of worried now that maybe I'll come home one night, you know, and she's going to have an ax like, well, this is it. I've had it with you, you know. Up in this left-hand corner, you got somebody getting gored by a bull. Uh, then over here, you got somebody getting eaten by a wild boar. You got a woman kicked to death by a donkey. Um, a man fighting a mountain lion with an umbrella, which I don't recommend. <laughs> this is one of my favorites. This is guy, he was mobbed by rats. You know, I just, I don't think that happens, but this was true crime, right? And uh, then you got a guy down here who was getting kicked and crippled by a frightened uh, horse. Um, up in the corner, another panther. Now, I do have to say, I looked into that one because it sounded familiar. Norfolk, New York is up near Potsdam. There was, in fact, a guy at this time who was attacked by a black, at the time, panther and uh, survived to tell about it. So not all these are untrue, with the possible exception of the man who got attacked by a seal and had to beat it to death with an axe. I just don't see that happening. <laughs> so there, there was a lot of journalism that was provoking this interest in the sordid kind of tales of murder and crimes of tragedy. Now, closer to home, one of the reasons I think that this case took on such epic proportions was that anybody who was anybody in Baldwinsville at the time was involved in the case. By that, I don't mean they were involved in the murder. They certainly didn't participate. But the aftermath, the arrest, the prosecution, the trial, testimony, all these guys were involved, and as Bonnie will attest, these are some of the big names from Baldwinsville from the late 1800s, right? You got your Bigelows and your Bisdies and the Greenfields and the Voorhees and everybody else. The Morrises, you know, Morris Machine Works down here. The only ones you don't have are the Baldwins because most of them were gone by now. Um, but you got everybody from a banker and a broker, a justice of the peace. Of course, DeWitt C. Toll was the deputy sheriff. Um, Rufus G. Pettit was a retired um, Civil War captain. And over there, you've got uh, James Voorhees, mayor and merchant. He actually wasn't called mayor at the time. The title of the, of the executive of the village of Baldwinsville was president. We had, a, we had a village president, so that's what he was. And then you had some doctors. You had Perkins, who was the dentist. You had Kendall, who was the physician. You had Greenfield, who was a notary. Anyway, all these guys were involved somehow, and it made it a bigger deal for everybody. That was one reason. But... All that notwithstanding, and the fact that I think a lot of this also took place on the streets of Baldensville. The murder didn't, but the aftermath did. The arrest, you know, the confession, um, where these people went after the murder, during the murder, and so there was a lot of testimony about that. Um, but, you know, that's all well and good. That's context for why maybe this thing took off and was such a big deal. But really, you have to go back. The catalyst of the case occurred out on the Seneca River, um, does everybody know where the Grange Hall is if you drive out 370? Yeah. Beautiful building on the right. Wasn't there at the time. It was a repurposed bulb storage barn from Indian Springs Farm, which came around 20, 30, 40 years later, Bonnie, maybe. Yeah. Um, so it wasn't there at the time. But that's if you want to stop and look out over the river and go, it happened there, that's where you're going to want to stop. So it's just each, east of the 690 bridge, and at the time, it happened right at the intersection of two properties, significant farms on the south side of the river in the town of Amburin, one called Harrington, uh, for whom a schoolhouse was named, and the other called Crego. Do we have any Cregos in the room? <laughs> Mary, you're way too young to remember this, but do you hear any, you hear any tales about this from your family lore? Never did. Never did, okay. I just hope they weren't involved, and that's the reason they didn't tell you anything. <laughs> All right, so 
Let's get to uh, the next question. We talked a little bit about why would it have been such big news in Baldinsville? Sensational journalism, a lot of local guys involved, cold-blooded, brutal murder. But what really happened according to the confession and the trial transcript? As I said, most of these cases, you don't have that available. You know, a lot of it's lore, stories passed down by oral history. But in this case, we have actual testimony um, and, and a confession from the accomplice um, that really spells out the events of, of, the, uh, of, the, of the crime. And like I said, normally I don't rely on notes. I just do everything extemporaneously. But in this case, I want to stay true to the crime. I want to stay true to the facts and the history. And so um, we're going to try to answer uh, that question. What happened exactly? Um, we're going to use the, tri uh, the transcript and the confession. And we're going to use the prosecutor, who was a guy named William Goodell. Well, the other thing I didn't mention was the prosecutors, the defense team, the judge all went on to bigger and better things after this. It was a springboard for them politically. Many of them became Supreme Court justices, congressmen, senators. So the people that were involved in the case from the judicial system did pretty well from this. I'm going to be joined in reading the testimony. Um, the prosecutor's name was William Goodell. Okay? He was the DA for Onondaga County in 1873-45. And I'm lucky enough to have not only a lawyer in the audience, but a lawyer who, I don't know, could be channeling William Goodell because his name is William Goodman, so it's real close. <laughs> so Billy's gonna, gonna help me out. Bill and I are, are good friends, and he's agreed to, uh, to do some of the back and forth during the questioning of the witnesses. So that's what we're gonna do next. Any questions before I move on to that? Okay, um, still no takers on holding the melon? <laughs> All right. And I just want to remind you that, you know, there's a lot of good reading out in the library if you're feeling a little squeamish right about now. So, you know, in 1874, these two fishermen, you know, they're out fishing in the river. Who hasn't done that, right? Nice June day. They got some time off. They're out fishing. But they made kind of a gruesome catch. And over here we can see it says Wednesday's Syracuse Courier says the body of a man was found last evening in the Oswego River near Bonsville by two men who were rowing in a skiff. They passed it first when noticing a dark object in the water, they returned and examined it when it proved to be the body of a man. Not exactly what you want to find in the Seneca River. It was found erect in the water with a heavy stone tied to the feet. On taking it out, it was found that the coat had been tied over the head. It's undoubtedly the body of a man who had been murdered and thrown into the river to cover all traces of the crime. He'd evidently been in the water a long time. He had dark clothes, dark hair, and sandy whiskers. No one in Baldwinsville recognized him, whether that's because he was an obscure, obscure citizen or he was just too badly decomposed or all of the above or other things. Um, and so I'm going to read you a little testimony, and Bill's going to help me out here. Uh, he's going to play uh, William Goodell. I'm going to play the fisherman Charles Fraser and James Honan. I have to let you know that these were not the upper crust of Baldwinsville. They weren't bankers, lawyers, doctors. They were common laborers. And I was kind of surprised to find out how little they knew about where Baldwinsville was. So Charles Fraser, a witness called on behalf of the people, having been duly sworn, testified as follows, examined by Mr. Goodell. Where do you reside? Baldwinsville. What is your business? My business is a blacksmith. Baldwinsville lies in what town? I live on the north side of the river. In what town is that? I live on the north side of the river, that's all I know. <laughs> what river runs through Baldwinsville, if any? Seneca River. In what direction does it run? I couldn't tell you that. On the 22nd of June last, what were you doing? Fishing. So then Joseph Holman comes up because you know, I'm getting the feeling Charles Fraser maybe wasn't a very helpful witness if he doesn't know what direction the Seneca River runs or what side of the river it lives on. Um, anyway, so he was called, testified as follows, examined by, Dr. by Mr. Goodell. Mr. Holman, where do you reside? This is the other guy in the boat. Well, I can't speak English well enough to know. Where do you live? I lived in Baldwinsville at that time. I was working there. Do you know the witness, Mr. Fraser? Yes. Were you there on this day that he was fishing in the river? Yes, sir. Tell what took place, what you saw, and what was found in the river. Well, I found a man. <laughs> the 
counsel suggests that there is no question about this point. With that suggestion, I will excuse this witness. So they weren't real helpful, right? They found a man, but they didn't have a lot more information. I think Holman was an immigrant and really had a, a difficult capture of the English language. So then we move on to the next uh, witness. And this is Mayor Voorhees. I call him Mayor. He was actually President Voorhees. It's interesting. This is James Leslie Voorhees, Jr. I got confused at first because there was a James Leslie Voorhees, Sr. who lived where, Bonnie? Well, Wig Hill. The senior, right. He was the tall pine of Lysander, right. This was his son who became the, uh, the president and was a merchant. And what's kind of interesting, and we'll get into that in a second, he thought he knew who this guy was just based on prior experience. So James L. Voorhees, a witness called on behalf of the people, having been duly sworn, testified as follows, examined by Mr. Goodell. Where do you reside? Baldwinsville. What is your business? Mercantile business. And now president of the village? Yes, sir. Did you see the body? I did. When for the first time? The evening of the 22nd of June. About what time? About 7 o'clock, I should think. State the condition it was in and what you saw and did. They were drawing it to the shore when I got there. It was within 6 or 8 feet of the shore, 10 feet perhaps. I took hold and helped pull it ashore. Then someone, I think Constable Carpenter, removed the covering from the head. There were two coats thrown over the head. Carpenter, I think, removed them, and we looked at it sometime, suggested that it was best to leave it there. How was it attached? By a strap. What was done? Well, I was sent back there to see if I could identify the body as that of a Mr. Bullock that had been missing. Now, apparently this, <laughs> this is a whole other story that I got to write. This Bullock guy was caught on top of a train with a horse bridle, was accused and arrested in Syracuse of stealing a horse out in Spencerport. They sent him back out there. He escaped custody, disappeared around Jaycox Hill. Horse thieving back then was a pretty serious thing. You can get hanged. And he disappeared, and he didn't show up again for 10 years. And when he did, he reinvented himself. He was now a retired colonel from the Civil War living in Alabama, married to a very wealthy woman. But uh, obviously didn't mention the fact that he'd been caught on top of a train as a horse thief in upstate New York. So at that point, they got to figure out, all right, who's the victim, right? Because we can't really tell. So we move on to the next witness. And this is Dr. Kendall. So Dr. Kendall was a part, partner of Dr. Allen. They had a, probably the biggest physic, um, medical practice in town. He performed a riverbank post-mortem in the company of Captain Pettit. Now, I don't know how qualified Captain Pettit was to conduct a post-mortem. Has anybody heard of Pettit? Yeah. Yeah. Pettit's Battery B, right? He trained a whole, um, he trained a whole, um, not infantry, artillery com uh, company. And they ended up fighting at the Bloody Angle in Gettysburg. Um, Pettit wasn't part of that. He wasn't there by then. Through sh shell shock or something else, Pettit ended up running the, uh, prison in Washington, D.C., primarily for Confederates and deserters, and unfortunately was dishonorably discharged because he was going out and grabbing people off the street, insisting they were deserters, and imprisoning and torturing them. So he's, 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 a, he's a hero for assembling Battery B, which fought at the bloody angle during Pickett's charge, but not a lot of people know that he kind of came back quietly with a, with a kind of a questionable record in the Civil War. Anyway, he was tagging along with Kendall, and Kendall confirmed the findings of the Onondaga County coroner, Alicia George, who'd examined the body the day before. And so um, now Kendall, a witness in behalf of the people, being duly sworn, testified as follows by Mr. Goodell. You are a physician and surgeon? I am. Of how long standing? I've practiced for 30 years. Residing where? Baldwinsville. Partner of Dr. Allen? Yes, sir. On the 22nd of June last, did you or did you not make a post mortem examination? I made an examination of a body on the bank of the river. Go on and state what you discovered. First, when did you go there? It was the 23rd day of June in the forenoon. I can't state just the hour. Who was with you? Captain Pettit. Anybody else? No, sir. Who was there when you were there at the body? There were a couple of other individuals besides Captain Pettit. I really can't call their names. Had you seen Coroner George before he went there? I had. He ordered me there. 
You examined the body? I examined it partially. State what you found. The body was in a box. Over the head was thrown a part of the coat that is loosely, which I removed, throwing it backward and discovered a large fracture on the right side of the head. So not a pretty picture. So that was Kendall, the physician. The next witness we have is W.W. Perkins, who was the dentist in town, um, also a postmaster and the administrator or operator of Herrick's Hall, which is probably the largest gathering place in Baldwinsville for formal events. And uh, unfortunately, as you see there on the right, that's what was left after Calvin was attacked. So not a pretty picture. Um, they did a number on his skull. But anyway, Perkins was able to identify the victim using dental records. And so William W. Perkins, a witness called on behalf of the people, testified as follows by Mr. Goodell. Where do you do reside, doctor? In Baldwinsville. What is your business? A dentist. Have you been a dentist for long? 25 years. Do you remember the circumstance of a body being found west of Baldwinsville in the river? Yes, sir. When did you see the body? The afternoon of the day after it was found. Did you know the victim in his lifetime? Yes, sir. How long did you know him? Uh, oh, I must have known him about 19 or 20 years. I will ask you what you say about his age. I think he was upwards of 30, perhaps 35. Did you do work for him? Yes, sir. I extracted teeth for him and made a plate of artificial teeth. When was this? I think it was six years ago this winter. I'm not positive. Five or six. What teeth did you extract for him? I extracted the central incisor on the left side and the lateral incisor upon the right side and more or less bicuspid teeth, the small double teeth on the side. So what are bicuspid teeth? As I said, the small double teeth on the side. How many in all, if you know? I do not. From which jaw? The upper jaw. Will you take the jaw, doctor, and tell us what you mean by the incisors? I presume they are not there. Which was brilliant, I thought. The <laughs> Guy just told him he removed the teeth, and he's like, show us where the teeth are. I presume they're not there because you took them out. So that was Perkins' testimony. So we're starting to narrow this down a little bit. Now he's got an idea who the patient is, and they're really trying to find out what happened. So, you know, I'm going to switch over and, and start reading some of the prosecutor's arguments at this point. I may call in Billy at some point for legal opinions. But the victim was a guy named Francis Colvin. And I really feel sorry for this guy. And you're going to find out why. He's a very sympathetic victim. He's a he was a local loner. He was an itinerant laborer. He moved from farm to farm and place to place as far afield as, you know, Jamesville, Fulton, Oswego, places like that. But he was based in Beeville and he helped out whatever you need doing, cleaning oats, milking cows, you name it, um, doing hay. The inquest developed that the remains were those of Francis Calvin, an unmarried eccentric wanderer who had accumulated considerable property and is known to have quite a sum of money about his person at the time of his disappearance. The stone attached to his feet weighed 63 pounds and the evidence of a foul crime is complete. I think when you find somebody with a 63 pound stone, 68 pound stones tied to their feet, it's a crime. The inquest has been adjourned for a week in order to a more complete examination of the circumstances attending his known movements just previous to his disappearance. So the prosecutor started here, started his, um, not testimony, what do you call it, Bill? Argument? Okay, and he said, and the facts, gentlemen, are these. Francis Calvin was one of those humble men in life, a man about 35 years old, having no family and having no friends in the vicinity that asked when and where he was going or when he returned, and from where did he return, but an honest, simple-minded man, unmarried, having no family. Those are all clues, right? So he didn't really have a formal place of residence. He moved around a lot. He had no family um, and really few friends, and, and so he was the perfect victim, right? If you want to think about somebody that you're going to take advantage of, nobody's going to be checking up on this guy, and he routinely takes off for parts unknown. Now. The one thing we know about Calvin, and, and I think he should be honored for this, um, is that he served two tours in the 11th New York Cavalry, or Scott's 900. So who's heard of Scott's 900? Anybody? Oh, my great-grandfather. Great there you go. 
Now, Scott's 900 was a pretty tough outfit. First of all, we know Francis Calvin had to be a horseman because you couldn't be in the cavalry unless you knew how to ride a horse and shoot at the same time. They spent a lot of time in Louisiana and Alabama in the thick of Confederate strongholds, and they fought some pretty hard battles, and they lost about half their troops during the Civil War, which was higher than most. And they lost them not to things like disease, um, like a lot of units did, but they lost them due to death in battle. So he was a brave guy. We know that. He had to be. Here's the only known photograph we have of him. Um, we think he was born circa 1844 in Fulton. We know he enlisted at age 18 in Company B of the 11th New York Cavalry. There's a recruitment poster for it. They mostly were recruited down in New York uh, City. We don't know whether he rec was recruited down there, up in Fulton. They did a lot of recruiting in Ogdensburg and places like that. A guy named James Slane raised and named the unit and named it in honor of the Secretary of War, Thomas Scott. Back then, if you were wealthy or a man of means or power, you could raise your own Civil War regiment and take them off and campaign, and that's exactly what uh, Slane did. Now, I went back and looked. Calvin said he was 18 when he was recruited. He wasn't. He was 17. So I think he really, you know, he was a brave guy, 17 years old, joined this unit, went down south, Many of their troops were decimated, and he re-enlisted. He re-upped after that. A lot of soldiers did not. They were either shell-shocked, sick, injured, whatever. Calvin made it through with unscathed, completely unscathed, and I think with honor. The prosecutor said of him, he at the breaking out of the war enlisted, served his time, and when he was discharged honorably, he re-enlisted and went back to the South. He stayed till the war was closed. He accumulated thus some dollars, and he came back fully determined that he should add to his little store, not a retail store, but his store of cash, that he should save the money that he had earned and increase it and thus be able to take care of himself in his old age. Again, he was a recluse, he was a loner, didn't have a family, didn't intend to get married, and he was thinking, I'm going to have to take care of myself in my old age. He may have had a pension from the war, but it wasn't very much. Now, after the war, when he came back to the town of Van Buren, kind of an interesting guy. Right? So um, he lived in a place called Pelton Wood, Pelton's Woods, way up here, which is what now is Button Shores Road off Kingdom Road. Anybody familiar? Or Gun Barrel Road? Anybody familiar with that part of the, part of the kingdom? Here's Dead Creek right here. Okay? Um, and that's not his cabin, but that's a cabin that was built in 1845 on Ox Creek in South Granby by this guy's grandfather, and he's old when the picture was taken. I have a feeling that, you know, Calvin's cabin didn't look much better than that, right? Obviously no running water, maybe not even a well, right? So it was pretty humble and pretty rustic, and that's where he lived, and that's the way he liked it. Now, he did do a lot of work in and around the kingdom, which was kind of a self-contained area in Van Buren. You know, Dead Creek was kind of a crossing point. A lot of people in the kingdom stayed in the kingdom, and so there was a, a community of people there that he could rely on for work on a regular basis. Yeah, after the war, he lived this humble hermit's life in a simple shack out in Pelton's Woods, almost right on the river. The prosecutor said, at this point, I say, gentlemen, that Francis Calvin leaves no friends or relatives to sit here by counsel interested in the case. So in other words, there was nobody there giving moral support to the prosecution team. He stood, as it were, alone, isolated. He lived alone and thus became an easy subject for any man who saw fit to take his life and rob him. To do so might be comparably safe because there was no man to ask, where's Francis Calvin? No family, no relatives to inquire his loss or whereabouts. I say Francis Calvin was a simple-minded and plain man. I wouldn't agree with the simple-minded. He was pretty shrewd and frugal and managed to save a ton of money in a very short period of time. But I think he had simple tastes and, sim and lived a simple life. So anxious was he to save his earnings that he lived at times the life of a hermit, having a small hut within the woods upon the farm of Philip Pelton, in the town of Van Buren. There living through the cold winter, cooking his own food, doing his own mending, caring for himself in order that the dollars he earned might take care of himself in his old age and not be spent in luxury and high living. So, you know, a pretty good citizen, right? He's on his own, not really relying on anyone else. Kind of here was Francis Calvin's undoing. And so I think sometimes recluses, hermits, whatever. They don't trust banks. Um, they don't trust other forms of, of 
places to store their capital. Here he is again on the left. On the right, that is actually a circa 1875 wallet, if you ever wanted to know what they looked like. <laughs> there was a place for stamps, railroad tickets, if you want it. It's, it's on eBay, you can buy it. I think it's like $75. But uh, there you can see real money from 1875, a couple $500 bills. And importantly, on the right, what do you see? Can you read that? Mortgages. Okay, smart guy. He wasn't just accumulating cash. He was accumulating notes and mortgages. So he was giving cash to local farmers who hadn't saved as much as he had and mortgaging their farms and collecting the interest. So he was not only a, you know, a frugal accumulator of cash, he was giving credit to other farmers um, who had big, large property and, and needed a little bit of credit from now and then. He was doing very well for himself. Thank you very much. Down underneath there, can you see this right here? Okay. You know, we know now from testimony, he carried about the equivalent of $2,000 in cash and notes in his wallet in 1873. What do you think that's worth in 2022? Take a guess. Not, not a million. <laughs> $50,000. So picture yourself walking around. You know, you're doing farm work, you're walking from place to place. And you got 50 grand in your back pocket. Uh, probably not very smart, but he didn't trust, you know, he had a little shack. He didn't trust keeping it there. He didn't trust the banks. So he carried it around with him. Now, at this point, we shift to the confession of the accomplice, whom I'm not going to name yet, but who gives us a lot of insight into who Calvin was and why he had all this money. So he made a confession on June 29th, just Three days, I think, after the body was discovered, they found the accomplice. These guys weren't the sharpest tacks in the box, right? So they buried the body in the river. They didn't weight it down correctly. The body floated up. It's discovered. And in three days, they already know who did it. So asked 25 days before the killing took place, um, the other perpetrator, the mastermind, was at the barn, and he asked me if I knew how much money Calvin had. I told him I did not. He told me to find out how much and let him know. I asked Calvin, and he told me he had about $800 in his pocketbook and some notes and two mortgages. Again, tens of thousands of dollars at the time. I told him, and he said he would make away with Calvin and rob him. The original plan was to kill him and attain, obtain the money. I was somewhat horrified by this proposition. Again, he's positioning himself as the accomplice and the unwitting dupe, but did not oppose it. Always had confidence in him and was with him a good deal. He betrayed my confidence once, though. When I went to the war, because the accomplice went to the war, uh, like Calvin, I left $300 in money with him, this is the mastermind, and lost it. He never paid it back. So obviously the guy had some shortcomings, the mastermind that this accomplice was relying on. Kind of interesting, um, we'll get to that, but the accomplice, Bonnie mentioned that Calvin served in the same unit as who? In the 11th Cavalry, the 11th New York Cavalry, Scott's 900. This accomplice served in the same unit as my great-great-grandfather, the 81st New York Infantry, known as the Mohawk Rangers. So it's a little world, small world. So in the spring of 1874, what do you think happens? Now, if you've got mortgages with, with somebody's name on it, and it's a victim, and the guy's gone disappearing, and he's found shortly later, and you're going around town cashing these mortgages and collecting the interest, it's probably not too bright. You know, he didn't even go to Syracuse. He went right downtown in the village and approached two men, Payne Bigelow, who was a banker and a broker, and very wealthy, and Martin Van Buren Harrington, who owned a farm out on Van Buren Road. I mean, these guys were like, you know, quarter mile, half a mile away from the crime scene, the perpetrators, and this guy's going around cashing mortgages in the victim's name. Not real bright, but as someone once told me, they're not always the brightest people, these, these criminals. So in the spring of 1874, a local man approached two others with Calvin's mortgages. It's this accomplice I've been telling you about. He started to confess. He got in the jail with D.C. Toll, the sheriff, who was a tough, tough guy, and started spilling the beans and singing like a songbird. And so he said one mortgage was for $350, the other was $839, a note of $60, another $30. Sheriff Toll 
has both notes and the mortgage. I sold the other mortgage to Payne Bigelow and got the interest on the $839 mortgage. So that spring, he goes down to Payne Bigelow, who's got like three different properties in town. He's a broker, he's a banker, he's well-connected, knows everybody. Um, he's from the Bigelows, of course. And then this guy, Martin Van Buren Harrington, has a farm out on Van Buren Road. And he goes to him and says, hey, I want to collect the interest on this mortgage. And Harrington goes, well, wait, this mortgage is with Frank Colvin. Oh, uh, yeah, but he gave it to me. So a little suspicious at that point, trying to collect on mortgages that did not belong to him. So then we move on a little further. So that was in the spring. And here you go in late June. The body rises up in the river. Everybody gathers on the riverbank. There's a post-mortem examination. They're able to find out, A, it's a murder. B, it's Frank Colvin. And what happened to the mortgages and things that he held. So it led pretty quickly to one man. His name was Bishop Vader. I can't grow a mustache, but man, that looks, I'd love to grow one like that. <laughs> now, Vader, again, at the time of the crime, was living on the farm of the father of the perpetrator, the mastermind or whatever. But he was moving around a lot. And so he was living at the time with this really old lady named Aunt Becky Rouse out on West Sorrel Hill Road. There's her farm right there about the same time that Vader was there with his family and Vader was arrested there by Sheriff Toll. What's interesting here is there's Aunt Becky's house, town of Van Buren, Dead Creek, Dead Creek Road, West Sorrel Hill Road, Route 31, what is known as it now, Crego Road, the Kingdom. Here's where he was living with Aunt Becky Rouse. Over here was where the crime was committed. You could walk there in about five minutes. Over here is Martin Harrington's house. Again, it's a five minute walk. He didn't really spread this around very much. So he stayed in the area, was trying to cash somebody else's mortgages, and, and basically painted a trail right to his front door. He didn't give up. I mean, he didn't uh, resist at all when, when, when Sheriff Toll came out to arrest him. He went very calmly and quietly to the jail. Um, he stated, and this is where his confession starts, and the rest of this I'm pretty much going to read from his confession because it, it really tells it all. The body was found on Monday night, and I was arrested Wednesday about noon. So, again, not a lot of time between when the body was discovered and Vader was arrested. He didn't really try to evade arrest at all. My name's Bishop Vader. I'm a little over 34 years old, have a wife and one child. I live on a farm in Van Buren and work it on shares. I've been in the Army, the 81st Regiment from Oswego. Again, that was my great-grandfather's, great-great-grandfather's. Enlisted in 1861 was wounded in the Battle of Fair Oaks, shot through both thighs, receive a pension, have never been arrested before this. I'm not a drinking man, and I never go on a spree. Was born and brought up in Van Buren. So you kind of get the idea. This is not really the guy who's the mastermind behind the crime, but he certainly was there and, and a part of it. So um, Vader uh, did confess to Sheriff Toll. The confession I just read you was part I mean, once he got in the jail with Toll, with the sheriff, he confessed and did something I didn't think was very bright. He immediately went to one of the Syracuse papers and said, let me tell you what happened. I'll tell you the whole thing. So clearly, <laughs> we've got counsel in here. I think my brother's here, too. Would you advise your client? Yeah, just talk to the papers and tell them what you did. We'll figure it out in court later. <laughs> Probably not a very smart move. So Vader, Vader confessed to Sheriff Toll. Here's Toll. Bonnie, correct me if I'm wrong. There's his house, livery stables, and next door was the village hall, which was where the Hooskow was, right? Okay. And there's Owen Lindsay, who was the mastermind of the case. That engraving was made from a photograph. I don't know if they intentionally made him look evil, but he looks like a pretty bad guy. Um, anyway, anybody know whose house this is now? Greg Raymond, right. If anybody knows Greg Raymond in town, that's his house. He's got the old Sheriff Toll's house. So he confessed to Toll, Vader, not Lindsay. When Lindsay first proposed to me that we make away with Calvin and take his money, I told him I would not be a party to it because I found out I would be found out. But he said he would manage it so as to escape detection. I told Lindsay about the money, and he said he would make away with Calvin and rob him. The original plan was to kill him and obtain the money. I was somewhat horrified by this proposition, but did not oppose it. I'd always had confidence in Lindsay and was with him a good deal. 
He betrayed my confidence once when I went to the war. I left $300 in money with him and lost it. He never paid it back. We talked together about the matter several times, and finally, the night before the killing took place, he said he would come there in the morning and make away with Calvin. So again, this was not a crime of passion. Nobody got in an argument. It wasn't an argument over a woman or anything else. It was just premeditated, cold-blooded murder, show up, ambush the guy, take his money, and, and get rid of the body. Now, a little background on how these two guys knew each other. These weren't just casual acquaintances. Vader, the accomplice, and Lindsay, the perpetrator or the mastermind. You know, I found out that um, Lindsay's family lived out in Plainville. Anybody people from Plainville here? No? Okay. Well, as you drive out Route 370, anybody know where Jay Cox Hill is, where Wig Hill is, the big brick house? As you're driving west on the right, the last house, this one right here, was Owen Lindsay's house. I was able to confirm that from the maps. Here's an 1860 map of where he lived out there. Now, he had a succession of enterprises out there. He was a farmer like everybody, but he ran the Plainville House, which was the largest hotel and tavern in this part of the county. And I counted, and the Plainville House between 1850 and 1900 went through 17 different proprietors, one of whom was Owen Lindsay. I have a feeling that it was a money pit. I have a feeling he lost a lot of money running that hotel because he probably didn't know much about it. He was a farmer. Anyway, that may, that may come to pass here. They were very close. Vader lived with the Lindsay family, and then Vader's wife and kid lived with Lindsay's family. These were not casual acquaintances or strangers. They lived in the same house. They were cousins by marriage. Lindsay was a little older than Vader, and I think Vader looked up to him as a big brother and a mentor probably could have chosen more wisely because I think Lindsay was a bad guy. And I think he got people to do uh, things for him that were not very savory, and, and, uh, and Vader was one of those people. Like I said, they were related by marriage. Lindsay was more of a big brother to Vader. I think they had developed kind of an unhealthy relationship, and over time, Lindsay was able to bend Vader's will to do his bidding. And we'll see later that Plainville may have more stories to tell about Lindsay and what really happened out there, or may have happened out there. A little bit more about um, Owen Lindsay. Uh, anybody know Pagoda Hill? Anybody seen this barn and this house out on East Dead Creek Road? Beautiful, right? So Lindsay didn't paint that. Here's how it looks today. Here's how it looked, oh, I think 50 years ago when it was first restored. The guy who bought it from Lindsay was a guy named Hamill, and his daughter, wife, somebody had spent time in the Orient and wanted a reminder of what it was like to live in the Orient. And so they painted the pagoda on the side of the yeah. barn and it's still been there for the last hundred and... Yeah, it was his daughter. Daughter, 150 years. After her mother died, killing her. Got it, okay, thank you for that. So here's his house on Pagoda Hill. There's that beautiful barn, lots of property, a much, much bigger piece of land. Let's go back one more time. I'm sure it's a nice house today, but you can see the size of that place. And then you look at this, right? A much more substantial brick structure. And so when you buy a much bigger house with much more property, what happens? Costs more, you need more money. And I get the sense Lindsay wasn't exactly the kind of guy that was interested in working real hard for his money. He wanted to find other ways to get it. So Lindsay was living at Pakota Hill. Um, Vader at the time was actually living with Lindsay's father at the Daniel Lindsay farm just around the corner on Route 31, right where the 690 interchange is now. And here it is. So at the time of the crime, all three men were working for Daniel Lindsay, Owen's father. I don't know how hard Owen was working based on what I've read, but the other two were working hard. You can see Pagoda Hill, that's where Owen Lindsay lived. Daniel Lindsay lived right there. Um, we've talked about it before. There's the Rouse House, Harrington, Crego Road, Dead Creek. You kind of get the idea. This is East Dead Creek Road. Wasn't very far between the two farms, and you could travel cross lots pretty easily depending on the weather. Um, so like I said, at the time of the crime, all three of them were working for Dan Lindsay, cleaning oats, uh, milking cows, you name it, doing the usual stuff, and it didn't pay very well. I think... Um, Calvin was making, I think, a quarter a day, if I'm not mistaken. 
So the confession continues by Vader. He says, well, Uncle Dan Lindsay is an uncle of my wife, and Owen is her cousin. So I've lived a good deal with Uncle Dan and worked for him. Owen Lindsay is a son of Uncle Dan, but has not always had a good character. So you're getting all these hints throughout the case that Lindsay's not, probably not a very savory individual. Now, just incidentally, it doesn't really have a bearing on the case, but I thought it was interesting. Right across the road from the Dan Lindsay farm, as I told you, it's right around... Right about where 690 crosses Route 31, um, there was the Harrington House. Their farm bordered Mary's uh, ancestors' farm, right? Up on Crego Road. The border went all the way down to the river. That was the farmhouse. And there was the Harrington School, named for the Harringtons. I think they probably donated the land. And they were right across the street from the Lindsay Farm. So it could possibly be that Owen Lindsay's, one of his, one or more of his kids, he had a daughter and a son, might actually be in that picture right now. What's interesting is this house, when 690 was put in, they destroyed the schoolhouse, they destroyed the Lindsay farm, but this house got moved. I've kind of given you a reveal here, but it's, does anybody know where it is? Uh -huh. Road. It's down at the end of Kamein Road. So if you drive down Kamein Road. I know it's the Thayer house. Oh, really? The Thayer house, right. Okay, Ralph Thayer and the farm equipment guy. But you can drive down the road and see this house that sat right across the farm 150 years ago. Again, it's where 690 crossed and it disrupted a lot of things, including your farm, right, Bill? So what happened? Let's get into this a little more deeply. You know, here you got Bishop Bader, Francis Calvin. These were the worker bees. Owen was the son, and I think he kind of fancied himself as a supervisor or manager of the other two's labor. This is the actual barn where the crime took place, and we can thank Tony Christopher for getting out there and taking a shot of it in 1964 before 690 came through in 1969. There are really only two pictures left of it. But try to imagine what it was like when they were in there. Think about how dark it must have been. You know, my great grand my grandparents had a dairy farm out on Church Road, and the milking parlor was in the basement, and the ceilings were really low, and there were very few windows. And it was a very, very dark, dingy place. And so if you were out there this time of year in the pre-dawn darkness, it, it probably was a, a place where you kind of kind of had to be, keep your wits about you. It was probably a little spooky. Anyway, um, Vader tells us what happened at that, at that time. So now, you know, Lindsay's talked to Vader and said, here's my plan. Let's do away with this guy. He's got 50 grand in his wallet. We'll divvy it up. We'll get rid of the body. In the morning, Calvin and myself went to the cow barn to milk the cows. Accomplice, victim. I took one cow and he took another. Just as we were about commencing to milk, Lindsay came into the barn and passed me. And he had, where did I put it? He had an ax in his hand, all right? Now, like I said, I use this every night to chop wood in my garage. These do a lot of damage. Um, I, I mean, should we skip the, me the melon tonight? We won't? Okay. All right. I don't want to get Robbie all juicy, so. Anyway, you'll have to use your mind's eye to figure out what might happen. <laughs> all right. In the morning, Calvin and myself went to the barn to milk cows. I took one cow, he took another. Just as we were about commencing to milk, Lindsay came into the barn and passed me. He had an ax in his hand. Probably not a good sign. Um, the ax we used to break ice in the watering trough outside the barn. Calvin's back was toward him, and he did not see Lindsay. So already, the guy's got his back to him, right? It's just not good. Next, gets worse. So this is an, these are actual engravings from the transcript from this book. Um, you can see kind of a depiction of the murder according to the testimony of Bishop Vader. Here's Vader. I don't know why he's got a smile on his face. I can't understand that. This is uh, uh, Lindsay with the ax, and there's Calvin milking away, completely oblivious to the fact that he's living the last moments of his life. I saw Lindsay strike Calvin on the head, above the ear, with the back of the ax. And I also heard the blow. I had a lantern to see the milk with. As soon as the first blow was struck, Calvin fell with a slight groan, as if he was catching his breath but did not make much noise. After Calvin fell, Lindsay struck him again with the flat of the ax and dragged the body of Calvin into an empty stall and pulled his blouse over his head. 
and then said to me, take hold of his feet and help me carry him upstairs. I took hold of his feet and we carried the corpse upstairs and laid it in the hay. Lindsay told me to go down and get the lantern and bring it up so that he could not see to cover the body. I did so, so that he could see to cover the body. And when I came over, um, when I came back, Lindsay had his foot on Calvin's throat and Calvin was gasping a little. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, it's bad enough he takes the money. It's bad enough he hits him in the head with the axe. He hits him again with the axe. And just to finish him off, he's got his foot on his throat, strangling him. Not a bad guy. I mean, not a nice guy. So um, this was soon over, and then Lindsay took Calvin's things out of his pocket. I kept the mortgages and the notes. I held the lantern, and Lindsay covered the body up in one place with hay. And then he covered the coats in another place so they wouldn't get bloody. And then we went down, and he went off, and I finished milking. Can you imagine that? <laughs> Somebody just got murdered in cold blood. There's blood everywhere. There's a, skulls bashed in. You just went and hit the body, and you go back, well, i got to finish milking. So Uncle Dan, the older Lindsay, says to me, because he went in the house for breakfast, where's Calvin? I told him he'd gone to Syracuse. Uncle Dan said, why did he go before breakfast? Lindsay had said before he went away that the old man would ask for Calvin and told me to say he'd gone to the city. Then Uncle Dan said no more after I told him Con Calvin had gone to the city and there were, there were no further inquiries about it. So again, I think Lindsay was counting on the fact that because this guy was itinerant, he moved around a lot, he was a free spirit, who knows where he could be next, right? He could have just said, I'm not going to do this anymore. I can make more money in Jamesville or Fulton or wherever, and he took off. That was part of the plan here was they picked somebody they knew people wouldn't be checking up on. There were no wives, there were no kids, there were no friends or neighbors saying, hey, where's Frank Colvin? He just disappeared, and people just thought he'd gone off. So then, Lindsay later met Vader in town. Lindsay told Vader to, uh, to rent a boat and row it out west of town. Remarkably, this is an 1880 shot of the village of Baldwinsville from the south, looking north. This is the river bridge. Um, Blanchard or Barnes Monuments, Bruce? Yes. One of them, right? Yeah. The Hacks Bakery. You've got the Amos Mill up there. And way up on there, those twin spires, one is the Presbyterian Church. The other is, I'm sorry, Grace Episcopal Church. The other is Herrick's Presbyterian. Hall. Presbyterian. Presbyterian. Oh, no, yes. No, Presbyterian. Presbyterian. Pres Presbyterian on the left. Okay, yeah, on the left. And, and the right... The right Right. So they moved it down the street on Oswego Street and where the Odd Fellows Hall now is, no, right? Not where. Pizza, Pizza, Man. Pizza Man, next door. There was a big hall, Herrick's Hall, that, uh, that Perkins controlled. Um, anyway, it's kind of interesting. But what's, what's, what's remarkable is, you know, within a couple of years of this shot, Lindsay and Vader met on this river bridge, right over the river, and hatch the rest of the plan, or I should say Lindsay told Vader what to do. Um, so uh, I'm going to use my friend uh, William Goodell Goodman again to, uh, to uh, interrogate the witness. If you can find it, slide 31. And uh, so this is Bishop Vader, a witness called in behalf of the people, having been duly sworn, testified as follows. Now, you say that you saw Lindsay that day? I did. At the village, did you say? In Baldwinsville. Did you have a conversation with him there? Yes, sir. Won't you state what that was? Well, he spoke to me and says, I want to see you a minute. I was going toward the canal bridge, and he was going the other way, going north. And he turned around and went back up to the canal bridge, him and me, and he told me up on the canal bridge that he wanted I should go and see if I could get a boat, engage a boat of somebody, and engage it to keep it until tomorrow, he said. And I asked him what he wanted of a boat, and he told me he'd tell me when I came back. What did you do then? I went and engaged a boat. 
And you then engaged a boat for how long? I told the woman I wanted a boat until tomorrow. I told her I'd bring it back tomorrow. What did you do then after engaging the boat? I went back where Lindsay was. Where did you go then, or where did you have the conversation with him then? We, we had it along the sidewalk going over the river. State what he told you. He wanted I should take the boat that night up the river by the line between Mr. Crego and Mr. Harrington and leave it there. And then he would come down that night with his team and take Calvin's body down the river, and he wanted I should help him do it. He said that they were drawing stone from the line there and that there was a road down from the road across the lots and he could go down that road to the river. What further was said between you at that time? Well, he told me that after I took the boat up that I hadn't better go into the house. He said I better stay out in the barn till he came down. So in this case, they were transporting a boat out to that point where the Harrington and Crego property came together in front of the Grange Hall in the river, and then they were going to go back get Lindsay's wagon, sleigh, drive it to Daniel Lindsay's barn, pick up the body, and drive it down to the river. So that's precisely what they did. Late that night, they moved the body from the barn to the river in Lindsay's sled. Now, this is not his sled, obviously, but we think it looks something like that. It was a bobsled, a working bobsled, not for passengers, but for freight. They had two horses drawing it. Um, and then late that night, they moved the body from the barn to the river in Lindsay's sled, and Vader continues on with his confession. About 10 o'clock at night, Lindsay came. The old folks and my wife were in the house asleep. These are farm folks. They go to bed early, right? We went into the barn and got some old straps of harness and then went to the cow barn where the body was. Lindsay took the coats and laid them on the hay, and then we laid the body on them. He wrapped the coats about the head and shoulders of the body, and we carried the body downstairs and put it in the sleigh beside the road. At this point, they traveled a lane between the Crego house and barn down to the riverbank. I'm going to call on Mary here. There, was a, there used to be a lane between, here's the old Crego house. Is that on the National Register? I know it has a sign out in front of it. Yes. And then barns over here, and there used to be a lane that went all the way down to the river because they used to draw stone up from the river. You're, Right. Really? Any bloody wagons driving through there? <laughs> so again, here's, here's 65. You've got River Mall right here now, but you can see the two old houses. What Mary's talking about is you go up the road, take a, a left, and it goes right between the house and the barn, and it goes all the way down to the river. Um, down by the river, you know, here's the Crego Farm in 1918, looking northwest across the Seneca. Seneca where, I should say northeast, where the former residence of Payne Bigelow is visible at the base of the hill where Dexter Parkway intersects with Route 370 today. And so this is that farmhouse you see on the corner of Dexter across from Tassone's. Um, that's that house. Payne Bigelow owned that house. And so this road, I assume, came down this way, down to the intersection of the two properties, again, closer to where the Grange Hall would have been across the river. At this point, they tied stones to the body. They threw it overboard where it was found in June. Um, Vader continues on with his confession to provide a little more detail and color commentary. I drew the boat on a pile of stones on the bank, turned it around so that the stern lay on the stones. We laid the body across the stern of the boat. Lindsay strapped stones to the feet and neck. I sat in the boat, and when the stones we're strapped, Lindsay pushed the boat off, and I rowed to the middle of the river to deep water. Lindsay then shoved the body off the boat into the water, and it sank immediately. We went back to where we started from and drew up the boat on the pile of stones, got in the sleigh, and went home. Calvin had on a pair of rubber boots, and Lindsay pulled them off and said he would keep them. <laughs> so the victims got rubber boots on, and Lindsay at that point, he's already got, you know, the cash, the notes, the mortgages, and to add insult and injury, let's take his rubber boots, too. Um, not a very nice guy. I learned the boots were afterwards found in a barn in the village where Lindsay kept his horse. So again, there was mounting evidence that Lindsay was, in fact, 
what Vader said he was, the mastermind behind the crime. Um, Sheriff Toll has them now, the boots. When we got to Uncle Dan's house, it was after 12 o'clock. Nobody was up, I'm sure, at that point. Lindsay went off and I went to bed. We had but little conversation that night. A few days afterwards, I met Lindsay, and then he told me to keep shady, I think which means keep quiet, and we would not be found out. He also told me what to do with the mortgages, which he said take them to Syracuse, but what did Vader do? He cashed them all locally in Baldwinsville, where people knew who these people were and said, wait a minute, this isn't the guy. So as to get the money on him, he said if the murder was discovered, I was to lay it on Peck or the McGoverns or some such fellows. So one more thing, just like if you get caught, blame it on these innocent people and let them take the rap. Nice guy. So at that point, I think we've kind of come full circle back to the day where it all started, that June day in 1874, when Charles Fraser and James Holman were just kind of out fishing, hoping for a nice sunny June afternoon, and pulled up something a lot heavier than they were probably used to. And that's when they found the body. So, um, you know, like I said, I try to ask three different questions in every case. What was the aftermath of the case? A couple of things. Well, first and foremost, um, both men were held in the Onondaga County Penitentiary, which was out on Lodi Street in Salina, Salina at the place. It wasn't out in Jamesville. And they were tried for murder in the courthouse, first degree murder. There's the old courthouse um, destroyed in 1968. Up here, what's interesting is the indictment. And I have to read you just a piece of it. So it's long. I'm not going to read it all. They basically specify the charges, as indictments do. But at the bottom, um, you know, there were notes made by the district attorney or the judge, I'm not sure whom, or the foreman of the jury, about what was happening at different points in time and each milestone that they reached. Um, October 16, 1874. Uh, defendants both arraigned and both pleaded not guilty. January 28, 1875, on motion of Goodell, the district attorney and counsel for the people, uh, ordered that a nolo pro seque, help me out, pro se. What does that mean, Bill? Put, what does that mean? Um, uh, not for yourself. Got it, okay. B in the can't read it anyway, the rest of it. Uh, and then January 26 to February 5th, 1875, defendant Owen Lindsay, because remember, Vader turned state's evidence. He confessed and he agreed to testify against Owen Lindsay, who truly was the mastermind for a lesser sentence. Tried by a jury, found guilty of murder in the first degree and sentenced to be hanged by the neck. Not just hanged by the neck, but they really said this back then until he is dead, dead, dead. <laughs> so they weren't confident that they could get it right in the first time. They wanted to try it three times. On the 26th day of March, 1875, between the hours of 10 and 3. Now, that didn't happen. Um, it was a capital case. It automatically got appealed a couple of different times. They tried to free Lindsay on technicalities in, in, the, um, in the trial and in the case, and it, it, it just didn't work. So. Lindsay was sentenced to death a little later than it says here. You know, as for uh, Vader, he turned state's evidence. He received 30 years in Auburn, but before he was ever released, he died there in 1882. There's Auburn State Prison. Gary, you probably recognize that, although it was a long time ago. And the Owasco Lake Outlet. You know, Vader, I think, you know, in the full light of things, I think he really was a dupe. He had very little free will. I think he was manipulated by Lindsay, made some very bad decisions, should have stood up to him. But it wasn't just about trying to cash mortgages in among neighbors that know who you are and who you aren't, but just the idea that he went along with this when his better judgment initially said, this is probably not a good thing to get into. He did write a letter from prison. I've read it. It's pretty eloquent and very sincere and very heartfelt. He apologizes to everybody. Um, he says, you know, he deserves to serve the sentence that he's serving. He learned an important lesson. Please don't take it out on my wife and kids because of what I did. So he died in prison in 1882. That leaves um, probably the least savory character in this whole ordeal. 
Owen Lindsay, he claimed innocence up to the moment of his execution. He was hanged in February 1876. What's remarkable is these are actually the three guards he had from the New York State Militia that escorted him to the scaffold. We have a picture of them that came from the Onondaga Historical Association. At the time, the Onondaga County Sheriff was a guy named David Cossett. It was his responsibility personally. At the time, sheriffs did the hangings. So he hanged Lindsay in the Onondaga County Penitentiary, um, as I said, in February 1876. I said Lindsay claimed his innocence right up until the final moment. There were some, I read some articles that said, capital punishment is so final, we should really look at this carefully. Lindsay says he's innocent, he never admitted guilt, but I think you kind of have to look at the character of the man and all the things he did and, and say, you know, this probably was a last ditch effort. They did say he smoked about 40 cigars from the evening before his execution until he went up onto the scaffold. So he may have been a little bit nervous about things. I know I would be. <laughs> you know, that leaves the, the victim in all this. You know, I feel bad for Vader. I think he was sucked into this. He did something wrong, and I think he had remorse. I don't feel sorry for Lindsay. Um, I think he was kind of a bad guy, and I think he got what, what was coming to him. But then there's Francis Calvin. You know, I mean, he was a war hero, right? He served two tours of duty with the 11th Cavalry. That was not easy service. Not a lot of people did that. They typically served one, came home, and licked their wounds, but he did not do that. He does have a grave in Riverview Cemetery, and on the grave, it does mention that he served two enlistments in Scott's 900. He is a, he's a Civil War hero, right, that met with a very, very bad end. And here's what I don't like about the whole thing. Instead of revering this guy as both a victim and a hero, you know, his artifacts became relics. What I didn't say in the case is after he was buried, they exhumed his body and removed his skull. Because you saw that Perkins, the dentist, and Kendall, the physician, handled the skull during the trial and pointed out different things that, that confirmed that, that not only Calvin was the victim, but that he suffered grievous harm and was murdered uh, with malice aforethought. But after that, you know, they kept his skull and the axe as a keepsake. I mean, Perkins, the dentist in town, as late as 1900, was bragging about among his many artifacts in his collection. He, uh, he has the skull of, uh, of Francis Colvin in his collection, like it's some kind of good luck charm or something. And that kind of bothers me. I think it should be repatriated with the body in Riverview Cemetery. Unfortunately, that was 122 years ago. We have no idea where this thing is now, right? I even read an article, and I shudder to mention it, that somebody after this said, oh, yeah, I've got the skull cap, and we sometimes, during celebrations, drink cider out of it. So not very savory. Anyway, so I think Calvin, probably we all could do a better job to make sure that he gets the credit that he was due and, and the sympathy that he, he is um, deserved as a victim. So that just really leaves one other vestige of the crime, and then I'll get into some questions about why I think Lindsay did it. And how are we doing for time? We're running pretty late. So, okay. As for the crime scene, what is it now? <laughs> There's the barn, the Robert Woods barn back in 64. It's now Taco Bell. So if you want to think about the case as you're going, to, <laughs> if you're going through the drive-thru and picking up a couple burritos, you could glance over and go, hey, that's where a murder took place. Can I have extra salsa? Um, last page, and I know we got to get out of here, so I'll keep, it, I'll keep it quick. This really is the last page. Why did Lindsay do it? We already said we think he's a bad guy. Financial pressures. He operated that Plainville house you know, had 17 different operators. I think it was a money pit. I think he lost money running it. He needed money. In the 1860s, I found in some obscure journal, he was expelled from the Masons for unmasonic conduct. This was long before the murder, so goodness knows what he was doing back then. Uh, I don't know what unmasonic conduct uh, is, is cons consists of, but it's probably not good. I think it was probably money related, right? He seemed to take advantage of people for money, like, uh, like Vader. The year after the murder, he traded his large home and acreage on Pagoda Hill to Erastus Hamill, the guy who painted the pagoda, for a much smaller, less expensive place in Peru. 
If you're going out 31 and you turn left on Laird Road and cross over the Erie Canal, it's right there on the right-hand side next to the throughway. It's a small home. I think he was downsizing because he had to. The year of the murder, you know, we had another panic. We had another recession in 1873. We talked about this in the last, uh, the last presentation uh, about the panic of 1837. You know, we had an economic depression and a crisis, and that probably exacerbated Calvin's issues. I think he had psychopathic tendencies. Um, there's a story that when he lived out in Plainville, you know, there was a peddler of, of patent medicines who went missing. And um, later they found all these bottles of patent medicine in, uh, in Lindsay's home, and the peddler disappeared. <laughs> so who knows what happened there, you know? Did he make, make away with the peddler and, and take the, uh, the, the, uh, the patent medicine? This is kind of cool, interesting. Now, you don't know how much of this is apocryphal. You don't, you don't know if it's true or not, but years later, a man recalled that as a small boy, his father and another man were filling in a well on the old Lindsay place in Plainville, that farmhouse I showed you. The boy was not allowed to look down in the well because they found a human skeleton in the bottom. So, you know, Lindsay owned the place. There was a skeleton in the well. Did Lindsay put it there? I don't know, but you know. When was the last time you found a skeleton in a well? So, And then shortly after his arrest, his wife Lucy um, was hired to help the Blanchards in town with their newborn son. She would moan while rocking nervously, which disturbed um, her employer. When asked what was the matter, Lucy Lindsay replied that Owen told me he would kill me if I ever repeated what he said in his sleep. So um, either he had a guilty conscience or he talked too much, but um, I think Lucy was scared to death. Uh, once Owen was gone, probably not so much. And then, you know, don't discount sheer desperation. People get themselves in situations they cannot extract themselves from. I think he was a desperate man, and, you know, Th Henry David Thoreau said it best. He said the mass of men lead lives of quiet desperation, but it is a characteristic of wisdom of wisdom not to do desperate things. So I think Lindsay was a little more desperate than he was wise, and as a result, probably a bad guy. And I think that's all I have on the Lindsay murder case. But if you're interested, in 1913, a poem surfaced that was written at the time of the trial called The Ballad of Owen Lindsay. It's pretty entertaining. It goes on and on and on. I won't, write, I won't read it here, but I got copies here if you want to read it. It's pretty entertaining and gets into the details of the case in kind of a poetic way. Um, it is 825. I know we ran over a little. So if anyone has any questions about the case. Who owned the Pagoda House? Was it the killer or his father or the Uncle Dan? So the Pagoda House was owned by Owen, the mastermind murderer. His uncle, his father, Dan, owned the farm over on Route 31, Kitty Corner, across from it. And then Owen didn't own it long. He sold it very, very quickly um, to this guy, Erastus Hamill, and downsized over in Peru, George I think because he was out of money. George, George Hamill. George Hamill? Yeah. Okay. His daughter was mother of Mark, um, Mark Hamill from Star Wars? <laughs> okay. Yeah, he was very young. I don't know the answer to that question, but I, I think it was natural. Okay. I think it was either cancer, heart disease, something like that. Okay. And, you know, I, I think the guy had a lot of remorse, too, right? I think he felt bad about what he did. He, he wrote letters that were truly, I thought, sincere and remorseful, but I don't know the answer to that question. But, you know, I got a friend here who worked at Auburn Prison for 22 years. Probably not a picnic spot to be in, either. So, you know, it's, it's pro it probably wasn't good for his health. Think about it back in, in 1880 and what kind of institution it may have been. Mm -hmm. Other questions? How soon before, uh, from the time he died to the time he was found? How far from the time Calvin died? To when the he got killed. Sure. To when he was found in the water. They killed him on December 26, 1873. <laughs> right after Christmas, that's another thing, right? And so Merry they Christmas. didn't find the body till. June of 1874. Wow. So it was six months. And they weighted them down, but apparently they weighted down the feet better than the head. And when the fisherman found them, he was vertical. He was bolt upright. The head was on the surface of the water. 
the legs and the rest of the torso were down below the knee. Yeah. Others? Fred? Why did, uh, did Bader ever explain why he went along with it, knowing that the guy had, you know, duped him before and taken his money and wasn't going to give it back to him? And he, but he went along with a, another, apparently, hairbrain, hairbrain scheme of it. Yeah, kind of hard to understand, isn't it? Yeah. You, you know, Vader did live, I mean, when he lived with the Lindsay family in Plainville, he was very young. He was in his teens. And then after he got married, his wife and kid actually lived with the Lindsdys as well. I really think he thought of, of, of Owen Lindsay as an older brother, and, and you know, probably didn't pick his mentor very well, but sometimes we can't. And so I think he, he just was led astray. I don't think he had much willpower either. I think, he, you know, he may have had... You know, he may not have been an intellectual giant, um, and I think he relied too much on the council, on bad counsel. I don't know any other way to say that. I think he got dragged into the whole thing, but I think there was an opportunity there where, you know, Lindsay probably got him to do a lot of things, but when it came around to, guess what, we're going to kill this guy in the barn and you're going to be part of it, that would have been a good time to say, no, I'm moving on. But I don't know the answer to that question. Yeah. And the Mastons, I don't know if you've heard of the Mastons and the Skanks and people like that. Um, as far as Calvin goes, no. He didn't have a wife, he didn't have any kids, he didn't, he didn't really even have any close relatives. So, again, I think part of our obligation is to... Do Lindsay or Bader or Calvin have any relatives that uh, are here in the room tonight? Or, I mean, you know, <laughs> <laughs> or, or, or in Beagle Bonnie, I don't know. About it, <laughs> so, Lindsay... Well, there were Vaders all over the kingdom. So there are lots of distant relatives and cousins of the Vaders. They multiplied, um, and they tended to stay right in the kingdom. So I'm sure there are Vaders around. I know they've gone through Baldwinsville schools at some point, and there are some in Memphis and Jordan. The Lindsdys kind of scattered, and then, um, you know, it's sad. I mean, Mrs. Lindsday was destitute, had to move in with her daughter's mother-in-law, and... Um, moved from place to place, and, and then her daughter did marry um, folks in Plainville, and there is a descended family that I was able to track down to present day, but none of them live around here. They lived out in Plainville. Remember him. He's got a grave site in Riverview. It's not decorated with any kind of star or flag or anything. I think it should be. Where is that grave site? What, what end of the you, you, I'd have to sit down with you and show you the map. <laughs> It's a big place. I'm on the board. Um, pardon me? No, it's about... No, it's not in the old yard. It's about midway between the old yard and the new part of the cemetery. There's a big section in the middle that's like concentric circles, and he's just south of that. So, um, I mean, I could point it to you after, out to you after this if you want. You can go see it if you're interested in such things. Other questions? Yes. Um, just a correction. So I looked up nole no prosequi, and uh, it actually means to be willing, to be unwilling to pursue, is the uh, English translation of Latin. So I don't remember how it was used in that, uh, but it says here it's a uh, kind of motion to dismiss. Well, I think, so you can chime in, <laughs> but I think it was... Vader agreed to turn state's evidence for a lesser sentence. He would have been hanged too. It was first degree murder and they were both involved. He got 30 years for testifying against Lindsay and I think the state agreed not to pursue the death penalty against him and to give him a lesser sentence in, res in exchange for his cooperation. So maybe that has to do with it. So, yeah, so they were deciding not to prosecute him for first degree murder. Correct. He got charged with a lesser crime, I think. Lessons learned. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Do your milking in the barn alone, right? Um, and probably a few other things, too. Um, but anyway, any, any other questions? Great. So we've, we've got a, uh, another session coming up. Help me out, Barb. Yeah, I've got to figure out whether I'm going to be ready for that. <laughs> it's like in three weeks. Um,
But I'm glad everybody was able to come tonight. This is a great crowd. This is like three times what we normally have. So thank you very much for coming. I appreciate thank it. You. And thanks to Bill Goodman. And of course, thanks to Bob Edgett, because you're going to be able to watch this probably like within 48 hours on Pack B. All right. <laughs>